What is gentrification and why is it so harmful for various communities locally and across the country? We'll discuss this issue on Talking with Henrietta coming up next. Hi, I'm Henrietta. Welcome to the show. Many residents in low-income communities especially look at gentrification as a threat. They cite rising prices for housing, a loss of local community identity, a lack of local community control, and a host of other obstacles. A new documentary, City Rising takes a close look at the process of gentrification and the displacement of local residents by development. Some say the process and its outcome disproportionately affect people of color. On this show, we'll discuss if this perception is true, if so, why, and what the options are to development and displacement. I am honored to have two guests with me today. Both will join me by phone. My first guest is Dr. Anthony Aiton. Dr. Aiton is the Senior President of Healthy Communities at the California Endowment, a foundation that was established to expand access to affordable quality health care for underserved individuals and communities. Prior to his current position, he served as both a director and county health officer for the Alameda County Public Health Department. Dr. Aiton also served as Director of Health and Human Services and School Medical Advisor for the City of Stamford, Connecticut. He was also a primary care physician for the San Francisco Department of Public Health. My next guest, Justin Cram, is the Director of Content Development at KCET Link in the Greater Los Angeles area. He was an adjunct professor with Pasadena City College, a co-founder of Let Go Magazine, and he worked for four months under a Design Matters Fellowship with Doctors Without Borders. And like, as life would have it, we'll be talking to Justin first about the new production, City Rising. So Justin, are you there and can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Yeah, so thank you for me. Uh, we will be seeing uh, in, in a moment or two uh, the trailer for City Rising, but kind of summarize for us what the documentary is all about and how it came into being. Sure. Um, so City Rising uh, is a documentary that examines gentrification and displacement as a result of gentrification across California through six communities. Sacramento, Oakland, Boyle Heights, and South Central in Los Angeles, uh, Long Beach, and Santa Ana. Uh, this is a program that's produced by KCET Link, uh, which is comprised of a uh, KCT, which is an independent public TV station here in Southern mm -hmm. California, and Link TV, which is a national mm -hmm. uh, public television station. Um, yes. Uh, go on. So can you tell me how, how the documentary came into being? Sure. So we partnered with the California Endowment uh, to, first of all, identify an issue that was affecting communities across California. Uh, and we felt that the predominant issue that's affecting communities across California uh, was gentrification uh, or displacement, which is, mu is a much better way to look at this, because gentrification is, in itself is a term that's often misused or misunderstood. Um, through the California Endowment, they provide us the opportunity to work with the different sites that they uh, work with across California, six of those which I just named, um, and they began to uh, provide us the opportunity to connect with these individual organizations that are established in these different uh, cities and communities. 
uh, through those communities and those organizations, we began to learn about the different uh, things that are happening in their community, everything from uh, the fight for uh, uh, renters' rights to uh, affordable housing development. Um, and oftentimes these were in communities that were historically disinvested in um, and, and oftentimes communities of color. Um, they uh, were incredibly uh, uh, open uh, to allowing us to understand the issues, um, but it took a year and a half to, uh, to develop this project. Um, and so City Rising is a result of not just the work of uh, our team here at KCT Link, but also the work of the different organizations and actually more so the work of these organizations that are fighting for uh, equity around California. Now, you, you mentioned that there is oftentimes a misunderstanding with just the concept of gentrification. So before we take a look at the trailer for the documentary, why do you say there is a, a misunderstanding of just of that term itself or a misuse of the term? Sure. So I, I believe and I think that, that the, the documentary represents that gentrification uh, is a, um, a word that's kind of used all over the place in pop culture, it's used in academia, um, it's used uh, sometimes in a positive light and, and oftentimes used in a negative light. Um, through the documentary itself, we, used, we, we began to examine gentrification, the root of gentrification, which is essentially a history of discriminatory and racist housing policies uh, going back to Manifest Destiny, the Mexican-American War, the Chinese, the Chinese Exclusion Act, essentially a series of different laws uh, that have discriminated against people of color um, and so essentially has prevented people from having equal rights to access housing. And more recently that's been uh, manifested through uh, redlining and covenants, covenants saying where a uh, community could or could not live in the 40s and 50s, and redlining determining who could have uh, access to loans, uh, or um, access to housing mortgages uh, in, the, in the 50s and 60s. Um, and that continues today. And so that's been what's really been manifested through this history. And so we really look at this through the first part of the documentary, through the history of the cause. And I think that that begins to provide more of a, an even perspective around what gentrification is. Sure. So now, you, uh, you're talking to me from Los Angeles, and I very much appreciate your availability to to be a part of my show today uh, yesterday uh, September 13 was the documentary's premiere yes yes and so how did that go and to whom was it shown sure so the documentary is actually a multi-platform project uh, so in, in addition to being a broadcast uh, one-hour special uh, that went on our different TV uh, channels, both on KCT and on Link, which is, has a national reach. Um, it also has uh, a one and a half hour long screening or screener that uh, is an extended version of that one hour. Uh, and that's being used for different uh, events like we had last night uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, and that was very well received. Uh, various organizations that were involved in the making of this film uh, were present. Um, as well as the various experts, and then we had a fantastic panel uh, with various uh, community or organizers. Well, uh, we've certainly uh, talked uh -huh. about the documentary, and I think by this time <laughs> our viewers would want to see some of it. So if we're ready in the okay. studio, if we could take a look at the trailer for it. So if you could hang with me, Justin, for the two sure. minutes that uh, we can uh, look at the trailer. There are over 250,000 families paying over 90% of their income just towards rent. Approximately 1.8 million new housing units are needed to meet projected population and housing growth. I moved from Midtown because I was priced out of my apartment. Low-income residents are scared to complain about repairs because we don't have any renter protections. Those who have been waiting for opportunity to come to Oakland are getting pushed out at precisely the moment when opportunity is increasing. This has never been a straight market-based process. This is 
There's always been government intervention creating apartheid-like communities. No lot in said tract shall at any time be lived upon by a person not of the Caucasian race. No Japanese, Chinese, Mexican, Hindu. And the legacy of that disinvestment we're dealing with today. For years, the leadership thought that they have to bend over backwards for developers. It's about jobs. It's about economic development. When you have market failure, it's stupid to look to the market to solve it. If we don't get it, shut, shut it down. down! Whose interests is more important? And how do you manage that conflict? I feel like this is one of the last opportunities a community will have in deciding what their neighborhood is going to look like. Good city! Good city! The rise of cities is upon us. This will require a whole new set of strategies. There is no right answer. There's a right process. And that process respects all of the voices. The biggest question we face is whether or not we're really going to have the courage and the guts to recognize housing as a human right. The question isn't whether everybody has the right to a house. The question is whether everybody has a right to a home. So Justin, that's a, a very powerful segment. What do you hope uh, the documentary will accomplish? Justin, are you still yes. there with me? I, I'm, I'm there. I'm sorry. There was some sort of uh, noise in the background. Um, so in, what, what we're hoping that this will accomplish, uh, first of all, is for people to be more aware of what gentrification is. Um, I think most importantly, though, uh, the, the work that these organizations are doing will have more of a reach through this documentary. I think that while we put a lot of effort and a lot of, um, of our personal knowledge and time into this project, I think that the organizations, the work that they're going to do is going to continue on, and we hope that this documentary is a way to uh, really celebrate that. Sure. Now, do you think it will change the minds of any realtors, any developers, anybody in power in city government? You know, the way for that to happen is really for there to be a shift in, in values. And while uh, we would love for it to have a, a really quick shift in that, that value in terms of the way that politicians and city planners um, and real estate developers uh, value who has access to property or who has the right to a home, um, I think that that's going to take a long time for that to change. And I think that maybe this film can maybe push that a little bit faster, but I don't think it's going to change the minds drastically. Sure. Justin, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to be uh, getting Dr. Iton's uh, perspective also especially since he also appeared in the film. So uh, thank you again, and we hope to be talking with you again sometime soon. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, if you don't mind, I would like to encourage your viewers to go to kct.org uh, slash city rising to learn more about the program. Thank you so much for mentioning the link. Very thank much you. appreciated. Have a good night. You do the same. So we'll be talking with Dr. Iton as soon as we can get him on the phone. Uh, it was a very powerful documentary. As Justin said, the documentary is about an hour. And um, it shows all aspects of, as he mentioned, the history of the founding of this country and the um, the country's relationship with the Native Americans, with the Chinese immigrants who came in, with Mexicans, with the settlers. And so it's a, a very powerful history with redlining. And it also shows how the government became involved just in uh, the segregation of the neighborhoods that we currently see. So uh, is Dr. Iton available to be with us? While we're waiting for Dr. Aitan, let me say a little more about the documentary. 
It consists of six 15-minute webisodes that will stream independently on demand, and it can be seen at the KCET website at kcet.org backslash city rising and at linktv.org backslash city rising. Hello? Yes, Dr. Iton? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much for joining us for the show. I just talked with Justin Cram, the producer, one of the producers of the video, the documentary. Can you tell me um, how California Endowment became involved, given the fact that it's very much involved in the health of various communities uh, throughout the area? How did California, the California Endowment get involved with uh, yes. city rising and the issue of gentrification? Yeah, so, so the California Endowment is, uh, has been embarked on a 10-year initiative called Building Healthy Communities. And it's based on the realization that you can look at, um, basically, you can look at somebody's zip code and predict how long they'll live. We've recognized that when it comes to your health, your zip code is more important than your genetic code. And when you try to understand why that is, you can look at you know, communities in the, in the Bay Area, in Oakland, San Francisco, um, you know, in Los Angeles, in various parts of Los Angeles, and you can look at neighborhoods that are you know, within a couple miles of each other, and you see life expectancies that vary as much as 15, 20, in some cases 25 years from each other. And when we look at the factors that produce the poor health in, in some of these communities, obviously poverty is one of those issues. But we also recognize that there's an issue of power, uh, the inability of people to essentially control uh, how their community e evolves and, you know, sort of what kind of amenities they have in their communities, whether it may be parks or stores or even jobs. And so gentrification uh, is really kind of a manifestation of power, um, being that you see corporate power, which is typically ownership of real estate and the like, um, displacing uh, human beings that lack power. And so our focus is really trying to build social, political, and economic power in low-income communities because we recognize that that, in fact, is what helps protect their health. Now, what would you say to those who would say that gentrification is just a natural outcome of market forces at work? And there will be those who have and those who don't have and those who look at live-in homes and others who are renters. And it's just a natural process and it's the natural way things are. Well, so housing is, is one of the so-called social determinants of health. So poor housing, particularly, um, you know, unaffordable housing, or living in a community where you feel housing insecure uh, adversely affects your health. So if we want to improve people's health, we have to think about that. You know, how do you mitigate against some of these um, unbridled mar uh, market forces that shape um, you know, how development happens. And keep in mind, um, people say, well, this is capitalism, this is how capitalism works. Keep in mind that um, most European democracies are capitalist democracies. Canada is a capitalist democracy. Sweden is a capitalist democracy. What they have uh, are other factors that balance out the unbridled force of capitalism. So there are regulation, there are rules, there are strategies to keep people housed, whether it be rent control or uh, public ownership of land or long-term leasing, other renters' rights. They have policies that are designed to essentially counter the unbridled force of, of the market. And that's important if you want to improve people's health and well-being. You can't just chase people out of housing constantly and expect them to live healthy lives. So who, whose concern should that be? And what would you say to those who would say, well, you know, that's big government at work, 
and having anything less than that is overregulation and a form of socialism and it's not a part of the capitalistic market or economy that we live within. Well, I mean, I think that argument doesn't go very far that, you know, just saying that market forces should control everything. If we allowed that, then we'd have raw sewage being dumped into our rivers and streams, and we'd have smokestacks all over the landscape. We'd have strip mining. I mean, that's, that's market forces operating, you know, unchecked. So we have regulations for those things. Uh, why wouldn't we have regulations for other things, um, like housing? Okay, and, and what type of regulations would you see that would, I, I think, it, further along in the video, the part that we didn't see, you talked about there being a balance, a balance between uh, development and um, people's rights, or people's rights to home ownership, or people's rights to housing. So what type of policies do you see that could be adopted or should be adopted? Well, so our, our focus is really on trying to ensure that the people who live in a community have control over how that community develops. All communities change. And the only question is, who decides what that change looks like? And should that just be those with the most um, money and wealth? Or should it be people who invested their time and lives building that community, living in that community, animating that community. So our sense is that people should have uh, some control over how that community evolves. And the ultimate referee of who just... And so what we are trying to encourage is people to look at policies that increase the amount of control that people have, who live in a community for a long period of time, uh, in shaping how that community evolves. Well, those policies would be, be enacted by government, wouldn't it be? And I, I, in seeing the video someplace along the line, I think I saw that it's not quite what sensible for people to expect the very government that set up redlining and allowed it this type of discrimination to exist to then be the arbiter of of bringing equality into, uh, into the picture. So who is it that's going to be? So I don't understand that argument because, I, you know, A, if it's not government, who is it? And B, government is us. And one of the reasons we seek to build social, political, and economic power is that we want to change how government operates. We want to change the power dynamics in a community so that low-income populations can hold government accountable for equitable outcomes. This notion that government is some sort of static, you know, you know, actor is false. Government is us. And to the, it's not operating in a way that's creating equity. We have to recreate government. We have to get new political leadership. Uh, that understands the role of government in trying to protect people's relationship to their communities. Well, I'm sure those in the red states would, would agree with that as an idea that government is us and we need to get new government, we need to have it operating uh, in our best interests and uh, get us jobs. That, that, those were some of the issues in the 2016 election. But that outcome isn't one, I think, that is um, uh, that coexists with the ideas that we're talking about right now or would further the ideas that we're talking about right now. Well, I, I just have to disagree with that. I, you know, most of these decisions are made at local government. There's, there's state government roles in this too, but most of it is local government. It shapes how development uh, evolves. Most of those decisions are in city councils, planning agencies, zoning bodies, um, and organizing people to participate in those decision-making processes changes the outcomes of those processes. So there is no big 
bad, mysterious government making these decisions. These are local people, for the most part, who have a lot of incentives, by the way, um, to foster development. That's how they get, you know, some of their taxes um, that actually run government. So there are some policies that we need to change to change the incentives of local um, planning and decision-making bodies. But um, that's, that's uh, doable. It's doable at that uh, local level. I, I would think it's doable at the local level if you have also the support of the federal government. But if you have heading the Environmental Protection uh, Department, for instance, who would uh, talk about uh, allowing coal, uh, uh, coal owners to continue to mine coal and um, not protect our oceans, allow oil drilling, it's difficult, I would think, to um, talk about the, the local policies without having federal support. Well, it, 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 I, I won't say that it's not made more difficult by having an unfriendly federal government because there is an enabling environment that is created by federal legislation. But, again, most development is a local matter. Um, there are state laws like CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, which shapes how development happens and, and what kinds of parameters are put around uh, different types of development. Um, but most of it is local. And therefore, people living in local communities can influence those processes, can hold systems accountable for more equitable outcomes, and have done so uh, throughout California. So uh, unlike some other policies, like general health care and you know, some larger environmental issues, um, development is, is primarily a local game. It's the happening in cities and, and um, counties around California. Well, I think your office is, one of the offices of the California Endowment is in Oakland, and gentrification is a real issue right now in Oakland. Do you see it an issue where the residents themselves have a, a, a say that will make a difference? Yes, in fact, it's a, a large part of the work that we're doing in East Oakland right now, which is organizing community residents along the International Boulevard corridor, because there's a bus ra rapid transit system going in there, and basically lead development, uh, transit-oriented development in their wake. So what we're doing is organizing low-income African American and Latino populations to be able to participate in the decision making about how that development happens, where the stops are going to be along the International Boulevard corridor, um, you know, helping store owners negotiate longer term leases so they don't get gentrified out, um, you know, helping develop cultural and art kind of signatures along that corridor so people will recognize that these places are being built for them and not for other people. Um, trying to help um, anchor institutions purchase land so that they can have control over the, you know, the decisions that are made about their properties. All of this in, in East Oakland today as we speak. Uh, and the city has been, you know, quite supportive of, you know, trying to ensure that the people who live in Oakland have an opportunity to stay in Oakland under terms that don't, um, you know, create difficulty for them economically. Sure. Now, in, in the documentary, which I hope our viewers will have a chance to look at on the KCET website, uh, Sacramento was, was shown and uh, as that areas of downtown Sacramento were developed more people came in, let's say more people came in out of the suburbs or maybe more millennials came in and the prices, housing prices increased, all new shops and stores were, were developed, were open and this just displaced the people who were there. So. Well, that's, that's exactly how gentrification works, right? So. So the idea is, so what can you do to slow, stop, or mitigate some of those market forces? And some of the things I just described are mitigation. They help 
you know, people stay in place. They help people uh, recognize that they're not, you know, that, that the development's happening for them and not for other people. Um, and then there are, are policies. Rent control is one policy. Um, you know, city subsidizing, um, you know, down payment assistance for low-income home buyers is another one. Um, the building of more affordable housing is another one. Um, there, there. You have to do. There's no silver bullet. You have to do a basket of different strategies to try to just counterbalance the pressure of the market. Um, you know, when the market senses opportunity and um, you know wants to participate in the in the wealth generation that occurs in that development. Now, keep in mind that. You know, they're public dollars that are driving a lot of this um, gentrification. When the when the government invests in in transit infrastructure, or the government invests in you know communications infrastructure, and then private sector actors seek to essentially leverage those investments and um, you know uh, acquire wealth through investing on top of government investments, that's not entirely fair. And we have to make sure that when government dollars are going into, um, you know, a, a community to in, invest in things like transportation, that there's also policy that ensures that can benefit from those tax funds so investments. So is, well. is that something that you usually see being done? Because we talk about gentrification being an issue of power. And it's usually those who have the wealth, who have the power, who are in government, who make those decisions. I, you know, I think that that is probably an overly simplistic analysis. I mean, I, I think that, yes, at the end of the day, power drives essentially these decisions. And that's why people are working in places like Oakland and Sacramento and, and elsewhere, East Palo Alto, um, organize people to build power. So, so Dr. Icon, if, if we could somehow in the studio uh, increase the volume of the sound, is there a way of doing that? So I'm having a little trouble hearing Dr. Icon. I'm sorry. Let me, let me try to get up. Is this better? Yes, that's so much better. Thank you so much. So uh, in terms of, um, so uh, let's talk about the people who have the money and have the wealth, who are the 1%, who can enjoy all of the benefits. Why should they, would they not be voting in, in many ways against their own interests? to do some of the things that we're talking about? Well, first of all, by definition, if they're the 1%, they're 1%, so they have 1% of the vote. But, so, like 99% of the money, the wealth in this country. No, agreed, agreed. But this is why democracy needs to be strengthened and optimized to essentially counter um, capitalism and, and sort of free market excesses. And that's what this whole process is. It's really about trying to develop a counterbalance to bridled capitalism. But at the same the time, I, I think what you're, you're talking about is, um, is something that we need to strive for. But if you look at the reality, more and more of the middle class is disappearing. The lines at uh, food giveaways are increasing. Uh, the ranks of the homeless are growing. So it doesn't seem at this point that the trend is going in the direction that you're talking about. I, I, won't, dis I won't disagree with that. <laughs> um, I think that's in part because our democracy is, is so broken. And the only solution, and I don't know if you've got other ideas, but the only solution that has ever worked to change this in this country is optimizing democracy. There is no other solution. Optimizing democracy. What does it mean to optimize democracy? It means to build social, political, and economic power in a critical mass of people living 
the inequitable conditions so that they can hold government accountable for equitable outcomes and change the priorities of government. So that comes with how, how do you get that mass of people together in low-income communities? Well, you do what Martin Luther King did. You organize. You know, you do what the gay rights movement did. You organize people. And you think that's currently being done on the scale that it needs to be done? Well, I don't, you know, scale is a big issue, big question. I mean, that, these are big forces, particularly out here, where you have the Silicon Valley, you've got, you know, you know, big income inequality in this state. So the scale is a very important question, but it is being done, and it needs, more of it needs to be done. It's being done, this is what our work is, the California Endowment, in, is the biggest investor in community organizing in the country. And our investments are designed to build power because we recognize that that is ultimately what creates health at, at the community level. So if people feel like they have some control over what's happening to them, it's actually good for their health. So it is happening. It's happening and uh, we're funding it in 14 communities across the state, including in Oakland and Richmond and South Los Angeles and in the Central Valley, um, and it's making change. There are policies that are being changed that are protecting people against being displaced. So, you know, I would be remiss, since you're the Senior Vice President of Healthy Communities for the California Endowment, I would be remiss if I did not ask you to tell us more about the work that you're doing, uh, the healthy communities, and more about what the California Endowment is doing. We could certainly see that, its participation in the city rising. But if you could, in general, tell us more about what the foundation is doing. Sure. So the California Endowment uh, in 2010 embarked on an initiative called Building Healthy Communities. And it was a recognition that the fundamental influencers of health have little to do with health care and behaviors and has more to do with the conditions in which people live and the stressors that people experience every day, primarily from poverty, uh, but also middle-class people experiencing these stressors as well. Uh, you know, being unable to find adequate health care or afford it, being unable to find adequate housing or afford it, being unable to find adequate employment with a, you know, living wage. So all of these forces conspire to create enormous levels of stress, particularly in low-income people. And that stress kills you prematurely. It causes heart disease, it causes cancers, it causes diabetes, it causes obesity. So it, it causes all of those things that we perceive an increase um, across low populations in this state. So what we decided to do in 2010 was take a billion dollars over 10 years and spend it in 14 low-income communities to try to demonstrate that if you invest and build the social, political, and economic power in critical mass of people living in those communities, that you could actually change the status quo power dynamics and change the policies that governed those communities. Those policies either promote or obstruct um, opportunity for low-income people. And so our, our basic approach is to invest in community organizing. We also recognize that we need to bring people together across disciplines. So we bring people together from education, housing, law enforcement, health, all together to try to work together to find common solutions. And we also recognize that people think of health as health care and behavior. In other words, whether you smoke, drink, or you know, wear a seatbelt when you're driving, and whether you have good access to the doctor. And we say that those things are all important, but they're not sufficient to create health. And health really um, is so much more dependent on the conditions that people live in, those conditions that generate stress. And most of those conditions are man-made, and they can be unmade. So our focus is changing the narrative about what causes health. Now, you started that, you started that, I think you said, in 2010. 
So have you seen any results now of the money that's been invested? Can you point yes. to, ah, can you, can you give us, share with us some of the, the changes that the investment has brought about? Yes. Um, four and a half million Californians now have health insurance that didn't have it in 2010. Um, we've got roughly a 40% drop in suspensions and expulsions in schools across California, uh, mostly impacting uh, boys and men of color. We have 280,000 undocumented children that now have access to uh, full-scope health care that didn't have this in 2010. There are about a million Californians that are eligible to reclassify their low-level felonies as misdemeanors, so they don't have to check the box on job applications or on housing applications. There are 500 or so new policies and systems uh, changes that have happened across those 14 communities, and those might include things like policies that are, are designed to essentially slow down the rate of gentrification and give people more control over how land use decisions are made in their communities. Um, we've recognized an enormous amount of policy change, and those policies control the opportunities that people have in their communities. So that's our basic theory, is that if you want to change health, you have to change the conditions in people's communities. Okay, now you, you talked about, you, you mentioned the increase in access, access to good health care. And I would think that that corresponded to uh, the Affordable Care Act, did it? Yeah, but the Affordable Care Act has to I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. The Affordable Care Act has to be implemented. Uh, it had not be been implemented? No. In, the Affordable Care Act passed in 2010, and then it had to be implemented in California, particularly for low-income California, uh, because Medi-Cal, which is part of the Affordable Care Act, was expanded. And to enroll people in Medi-Cal takes work and money. and. California Endowment paid for that enrollment across the entire state. Okay, now, uh, the Affordable Care Act was not rescinded, so uh, presumably uh, what was accomplished will not be changing, at least not in the near future. So those benefits, those enrollments that you point to, they're still ongoing. Yeah. Okay. Now, in the time that's left, there there are certainly some things that we haven't talked about, and so I would like to hear from you now in the few minutes that we have left, whatever there is that you would like to share that you think is important in terms of city rising, in terms of the California endowment, healthy communities, whatever you'd like to leave our viewers with. Well, I think that the, you know, the take-home message is that um, America, and California in, in particular, uh, has lost its social compact. You know, that agreement between government and the citizens that the government is in those things that will give people meaningful access to opportunity. So things like universal health care, um, subsidized child care, access to post-secondary education, those kinds of things are a struggle for most Californians and most Americans. In most other developed countries, those things are subsidized by the government because the government recognizes that all people need these things and therefore there ought to be a good infrastructure for people to be able to access that kind of resource in order to pursue opportunity. But our goal in California is to rebuild California's social compact, is to focus on ensuring that that opportunity environment is for all Californians. And that has to pass universal health care in this state. It's unacceptable that anybody would could go bankrupt because they got sick. We have to subsidize post-secondary education. Everybody should at least have the option, if they so choose, to go to college at an affordable rate. And these are, things are happening, by the way, in California. Uh, we just passed a bill that would provide free one year of community college in 
California um, for all Californians. That's the kind of opportunity that we need to reinvest in in California. We just passed paid um, parental leave for smaller size companies uh, in California, which is critical. Uh, so there's a whole host of what I refer to as the social compact. There are policies that are designed to create opportunity for all people, with a particular emphasis on low-income people who struggle unnecessarily when these policies don't exist. And that's what California is in the process of creating. Unlike the federal government, who's trying to dismantle it, we in California are actually trying to build, sustain uh, that opportunity infrastructure for all Californians. Well, it seems that California is, in fact, ahead of the curve. And when you talk about that social compact, some would say that that social compact never really existed for all Americans, but only for some Americans. And so it's heartening to hear that you would restore that compact and, and then expand it to include all Americans, regardless of race, color, income, nationality, et cetera. Final words? I, I, I would only ditto what you just said. That's exactly what we're doing, and that's exactly what needs to be done. Well, Dr. Aitana, I'd like to thank you very much for the time that you have given us, for your input about the work that you're doing with Healthy Communities, about the video uh, City Rising, and for um, the sharing that you have done and the input. So right now, in the few seconds remaining, the last words are yours. I would just encourage everybody to go to our website at um, buildinghealthycommunities.org and you know, see for yourself some of the resources that are what actually creates health. Thank you so that's much. Uh, that's buildinghealthycommunities.org. I'd like to thank you for sharing, and I'd also like to thank our, watch, our viewers for watching. Until next time.